Hello. First, I'd just like to say thank you for sticking around with this series so far. But thank you mainly for sticking around with Marx's ideas, especially because of how difficult the first few chapters can be. This chapter is notorious for being a very tough read, and most people who quit reading Capital do so during this chapter. Because of this, this video on the first two sections will be slightly longer than I had planned. However, I don't want to put you off. I hope you stick with it as it's actually very interesting and things do become much easier over the next few chapters as we start to see some of Marx's revolutionary ideas unfold. Before going forwards, let's just quickly recap some significant points from the previous chapters. Value is determined by the socially necessary labour time embodied in a commodity. Commodities can only find their worth in relation to all other commodities. Over time, due to social and exchange relations, the universal equivalent emerges, money. Eventually, precious metals, most notably gold, which could be evenly divided by weight, became to function as money. Money expresses its value and worth in relation to the ever-expanding amount of commodities that are produced, but the value of gold is still determined by the socially necessary labour time it takes to extract and produce that gold, so gold becomes a representation of value. As a measure of value and a standard of price, money performs two functions. First, it is the measure of value as a social incarnation of human labour. Second, it serves as the standard of price, as a quantity of metal with a fixed weight. In the real world, commodities, let's say our football and our hats, don't have labels on them saying, this took one hour of socially necessary labour time to make, and this only took half an hour. In the real world, the value of every single commodity is unclear. We have no way of knowing exactly how long the millions of footballs being produced in thousands of factories around the world took to make. Instead, we have price. Price is the monetary expression of value. It's an estimation or merely a representation. Historically, the standards of price were set by the state and national governments, who set the price on the weight of gold, the price of money and thus the price of all other commodities are reflected in this. For example, if it takes the same amount of socially necessary labour time to produce one tonne of iron as it does to produce one ounce of gold, and the price of one ounce of gold is set at £12, then it also costs £12 for a tonne of iron, so you'd be able to buy one tonne of iron with 12 gold coins. States and national governments set the price of gold and also governed over the regulation and minting of gold into coinage, essentially making sure that all coins were of equal weight. Because coins were made from the physical precious metals, it began to cause a few issues for states and national governments. General wear and tear was one, but interestingly another issue was that people were debasing and defrauding the coins by shaving or breaking small bits off. Coins that were less than their worth began to circulate, keeping their price, but not their value in weight. To combat this, states eventually swapped to producing coins from less precious metals, while keeping the names of the weight. So here now we have coins that represent weight that represent value. The price or money form of commodities is, like their form of value generally, a form quite distinct from their palpable bodily form. It is, therefore, purely ideal. If we remember back to the contradiction that arose in the previous chapter, that value can only be realised after exchange, then price becomes a measure of an ideal. It becomes the measure of an anticipation of value, what the seller hopes to get in exchange for their commodity. Price is a representation of value. This becomes an important distinction, as price can change while value stays the same, and vice versa. Imagine that everybody suddenly wants to buy our footballs, the price of footballs will be increased as a reaction to the demand, however its value, the socially necessary labour time embodied within, has not changed. In contrast, maybe no one wants to buy our footballs at the price that's the same as their value, so the price is lowered and the full value is not realised. Or maybe no one wants to buy our footballs at all, so no value is realised, because for a commodity to have value, it must be exchanged. If prices are below or above their value, 
then their exchange is unequal. What Marx is arguing here is that price fluctuates around value. If you found any of this confusing, don't worry. The main argument to think about here is that price is only ever a monetary representation of value. Marx returns to these ideas of price and supply and demand in volume 3. And lucky for us, none of this is really relevant to the theory throughout volumes 1 or 2. In the introductory video, where I discuss Marx's aim for this book, Marx is meeting classical political economists on their own terms and dealing with a perfectly functioning capitalist system. And so, from now on, we'll consider price to always be equal to value anyway. Insofar as exchange is a process by which commodities are transferred from hands in which they are non-use values to hands in which they become use values, it is a social circulation of matter. The product of one form of useful labour replaces that of another. When once a commodity has found a resting place where it can serve as a use value, it falls out of the sphere of exchange into that of consumption. In this section, Marx is examining the role and functions of money in the process of exchange in greater detail. Now that money has been established and exchange is no longer done by the producers themselves directly, money becomes a mediator between commodities. In today's world, if we'd like to get a product, we very rarely just exchange one we already have directly for whatever it is we would like. First, we sell our commodity for money and then use that money to buy the commodity we want. In analysing this, Marx simplifies the exchange process to the circuit CMC. C, a commodity of any type or quantity, being exchanged for M, money of whatever quantity, then be an exchange for C, whatever desired commodity. The first thing Marx does is to break down this circuit into two parts. Commodity exchange for money, C to M, the sale, and money exchange for commodity, M to C, the purchase. Starting with the sale, C exchange for M, the owner of the commodity realises its exchange value, the exchange value of C now has an actual existence in the form of money. The owner of C has accomplished the first metamorphosis or change of form. When this money, the exchange form value of C, is then used to make the purchase M to C, the second metamorphosis occurs, as the use value of this commodity becomes realised after purchase and is used or consumed. What has happened here is both commodities have now dropped out of this circuit, but the money, M, hasn't. It keeps circulating. Marx sees this process as the solution to the contradiction posed in Chapter 2, that a commodity must have a use value before it can be exchanged, but must have an exchange value before it can be used. The mediation of exchange between two commodities by money resolves the issue in a process. Money's use value is its exchange value. It's only because of this contradiction that money arises in the first place. But it's money that resolves this contradiction. Commodities are in love with money, but the course of true love never did run smooth. Let's return to the circuit again for a moment, as Marx has a few more interesting observations. First, the sale, C to M. In this exchange, there is a high degree of chance and waiting. For the commodity to sell, there must be a buyer and an interest in the commodity. In the second part of the circuit, the purchase, M to C, there is less chance involved and it's a faster process. Money can be always used to purchase any commodity and there's always somebody selling something. In addition to this, no one can sell unless somebody else purchases, but no one needs to directly purchase if they've just sold. If someone holds on to their money after a sale for some reason and doesn't make a purchase, then the other person cannot sell their commodity. Only one commodity drops out of the circuit and the money doesn't circulate. These are very interesting points for two reasons. Firstly, because it directly contradicts classical political economists who claim that overproduction is impossible in a free market economy. And secondly, we begin to see how our economic crises form when commodities aren't exchanged to realise their value and the circulation of money stops. 
cornea does not vanish on dropping out of the circuit of the metamorphosis of a given commodity. It is constantly being precipitated into new places in the arena of circulation vacated by other commodities. When one commodity replaces another, the money commodity always sticks to the hands of some third person. Circulation sweats money from every pore. The circuit we just examined, CMC, is obviously just one small moment within the general circulation process as a whole, which is made up of many, many exchanges between many people and lots of commodities. Examining this in further detail, we can see how these exchanges might interact. For example, buyer A exchanges their commodity for money, which they then use to purchase a commodity from seller B. Seller B has now changed the form of his or her commodity to money, and now as a buyer uses this money to purchase a commodity from seller C. Seller C, now a buyer, then uses this money to purchase a commodity from seller D, and so on and so on for infinity. There's a few things that we immediately notice about this total process. First, the origin of the money is hidden from the sellers of commodities. Seller D has no idea how buyer C got their money and what they exchanged for it. Just like we have no idea how seller A got theirs in the first place. The fact that money itself is a representation of value and the relationship between social relations in labour processes has become completely hidden to us now. The next thing we notice is that the sellers of commodities have no interest in their use values, only their exchange values. So within this total process, commodities also circulate between owners before being consumed. What becomes observable in the total process is that there's now two parallel circuits that are dependent on each other. Money functions to circulate commodities, while the circulation of commodities functions as a circulation of the money. Marx highlights that the exchange of money circulation can be expressed in the circuit of MCM money exchanged for a commodity to be exchanged for money. The next chapter will begin to deal with this in greater detail, but for now Marx is just making us aware of it. Just as the currency of money, generally considered, is but a reflex of the circulation of commodities, or of the antithetical metamorphosis they undergo, so too the velocity of that currency reflects the rapidity with which commodities change their form. Within this circulation process, Marx has established how money functions in relation to the circulation of commodities. What we now have to consider is, in a world of uh, vast amounts of commodities, of different values and quantities that are all waiting to be exchanged, how much money is needed in circulation to ensure that all commodities can be exchanged and at a given velocity or speed. Marx calculates that the quantitative aspect of money, or the amount of money, M, that is needed for circulation, can be defined by the total value of all commodities, PQ, divided by the necessary velocity, V, or the formula, M, equals PQ, divided by V. In essence, that the total value of commodities and their velocity determines the amount of money in circulation. Classical economists claim that the prices of commodities were affected by the amount of money that was put into circulation. Marx's theory argues otherwise. An example he gives is that many classical theorists argued that during the 16th century, there was a huge increase in the prices of commodities in Europe during the pillaging of gold from the Americas because of the vast amounts of precious metals, money, quickly entering into circulation. What Marx's theory shows is the opposite, that the sudden accessibility of gold and the masses amounts of slave labour used in the mines producing it dramatically lowered the amount of socially necessary labour time to produce gold, greatly lowering its value. So with the lowering of the value of gold, and thus the lowering of its value as money, it meant more money was needed to represent the values of the unchanged quantities of other commodities throughout Europe therefore the rise in prices. In this process, which continually makes money pass from hand to hand, the mere symbolic existence of money suffices. Its functional existence absorbs, so to say, its material existence. 
being a transient and objective reflex of the prices of commodities. It serves only as a symbol of itself and is therefore capable of being replaced by a token. In section one, we discussed how coins issued by the state and national governments to represent the value of gold eventually started to be made from less precious metals. Within the context of the circulation process, we can easily observe how this works. If money's function is simply to facilitate the circulation of commodities and never stop circulating, then it makes no sense for them to be made from gold or any precious metal. Coins of cheaper metal and paper money, regulated by the state and serving as symbols of the appropriate amount of gold, can function just the same.